Is it not the case that the spread of Christianity, about which you spoke so warmly and affectingly in your opening remarks, attributing it to its in, the innate truth of the Bible story, uh, was spread by that means or because the Emperor Constantine decided to make Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire? Which, in your view, contributed more to the spread of the faith? Uh, the Holy Spirit. I rest my case. Someone who bases everything on reason has faith in the reasoning process. What's wrong with saying that? Why because can't you I, say, I have confidence in reason, I have faith in reason, I trust in the reasoning process? You won't say that because it will reveal that both our positions are faith positions. If you ask me why I believe in the Bible and I flip open the Bible and show you a verse, you say you're appealing to what you need to prove. If I ask you why do you believe in reason and give well, me a reason, you then what, you open uh, your you uh, open your book, no, you I, open the reason and yeah, give me a reason. No, no, you, you again, you're making a huge leap. I say, I say that the Bible, like the Quran and like the Torah, is man-made, not God-made. It's a, it's a, it's a human-made literary accretion, full of plagiarism, contradiction, fragmentation, and so on. It's like every other book ever written. And I wrote, There's nothing divine about it, and the appeal to, to it saying, I can trump anything you say because here's God's word on the page, is a contemptible way of arguing. I, I wrote a logic textbook. Does that make logic man-made? Uh, logic is man-made, yes. <laughs> yeah. So logic is, so there's no reason to follow it then? No. If, there's, if I reject the Bible because it's man-made. Philosophy, philosophy, logic, logic is the attempt by humans to make sense. It isn't, it, isn't, it isn't a divine endowment that we possess. Same with philosophy. Philosophy means the love of wisdom. We don't say it's the revelation by... You say what you have is revealed. Now, here's the way of clarifying the difference between us somebody asked earlier. I don't claim to know more than I can. Everything I've said this evening, I've backed by assertions evidence argument. Douglas Wilson, who's just as modest and friendly and tender a chap as I am, says, yeah, but I have an advantage over Christopher, which is I know what God wants and I know what he says and in his book. I have access to a higher authority. Now, what I want you, I'll ask him, but I, I don't care. I've asked him before. You have to ask him. How does he know that? And by what right does he claim to know the mind of of God. And if you were a serious spiritual person, wouldn't you think it was a bit much that someone said? They could come before you and tell you what God wanted? As long as they don't call it modesty, I don't mind. As long as they don't call it humility, I don't mind. But I don't like being told that my arguments aren't as good as his because he has uh, divine information that's withheld from me. Uh, the, the, neither of us can prove or disprove the existence of God. The difference is between us. I don't say that I'm an ordained minister. I don't think I could push it that far. On the, on the, uh, since, since you're evidently an agnostic, which is a confession that I'm very welcome to have uh, not extracted from you, but heard you make. Now, here's the question. <laughs> you say these texts are misused. I say that they are not. Um, the Old Testament says or does not say that Abraham was doing a noble thing by offering to sacrifice a son to prove himself loyal to God or to the voices he was hearing in his head. It says there was a noble thing for him to do. He was rewarded for it by a great, a great posterity and a great uh, long life. Offering to murder his son because of hearing voices in his head. This is not moral teaching to me. Is it not the case that the, that the Old Testament uh, says that the Amalekites must all be destroyed down to the last child? Every one among them. Not, leave not one... Yes, it does say that. The Bishop of Landaff, in an argument with Thomas Paine, once said, well, when it says keep the women, as Paine had pointed out, he said, I'm sure God didn't mean just to keep them for immoral purposes. But what does the Bishop of Landaff know about that? He says, kill all the men, kill all the children, and keep the virgins. I think I know what they had in mind. I don't think it's moral teaching. <laughs> in the ordinary moral universe, the good will do the best they can. The worst will do the worst they can. But if you want to make good people do wicked things, you'll need religion. <laughs> now, I've got now one minute and 57 seconds to say why I think this is very self-evident in our material world. Let me ask Tony again, because he's here. Um, and because the... The place where he is seeking peace is the birthplace of monotheism. So you might think it was unusually filled with refulgence. 
and love and peace. Everyone in the uh, civilized world has roughly agreed, including the majority of Arabs and Jews and the international community, that there should be enough room for two states, for two peoples in the same land. I think we have a rough agreement on that. Why can't we get it? The UN can't get it. The US can't get it. The Quartet can't get it. The PLO can't get it. The Israeli parliament can't get it. Why can't they get it? Because the parties of God have a veto on it, and everybody knows that this is true. Because of the divine promises made about this territory, there will never be peace, there will never be compromise. There will instead be misery, shame, and tyranny, and people will kill each other's children for ancient books and caves and relics. And who is going to say that this is good for the world? And that's just the, argument, the example nearest to hand. Have you looked lately at the possibility that we used to discuss as children in fear? What will happen when, when messianic fanatics get hold of an apocalyptic weapon? Well, we're about to find that out as we watch the Islamic Republic of Iran and its party of God allies uh, make a dress rehearsal for precisely this. Have you looked lately at the revival of Tsarism in Putin's Russia where the black cowled, black coated leadership of Russian orthodoxy is draped over an increasingly xenophobic, tyrannical, expansionist and aggressive uh, regime. Have you looked lately at the teaching in Africa and the consequences of it of a church that says AIDS may be wicked but not as wicked as condoms? That's exactly no seconds left ladies and gentlemen. I've done my best. Believe me, I have more. Um, <laughs> Let's say that the consensus is that our species, we being the higher primates, um, Homo sapiens, have been, has been on the planet for at least 100,000 years. In order to be Christian, you have to believe that for 98,000 years, our species suffered and died, most of its children dying in childbirth, most other people died, having a life expectancy of about 25, dying of their teeth, famine, struggle, bitterness, war, suffering, misery, all of that for 98,000 years, heaven watches it with complete indifference. And then 2,000 years ago, he thinks, that's enough of that. We should, it's time to intervene. The best way to do this would be by condemning someone to a human sacrifice somewhere in the less literate parts of the Middle East. Not, don't let's appear to the Chinese, for example, where people can read and study evidence and have a civilization. Let's go to the desert and have another revelation there. This is nonsense. You, it, it, it can't be believed by a thinking person. Um, religion gets its morality from us. I think it's very easy to demonstrate that. I'd do it from one of each of the two testaments. Um, you back on testaments. Um, well, you know, well, Why don't you write a book, a, testaments I, I, are not great. I spend a lot of time with my, I spend a lot of time with my, my Bible, okay? My babble, I do. I told you had well, a bad Sunday school they call it in Dixie. I do. In the, um, there's a very famous parable in the, in the New Testament where the alleged Jesus of Nazareth tells a story about a man from Samaria, we call him the Good Samaritan, who finding a fellow creature in enormous distress and pain, uh, goes well out of his way uh, to alleviate his suffering and to follow up to make sure that his, his uh, sympathy hasn't been a waste of time, to, to do the, the aftercare, if you like. Well, we know one thing about this person from Samaria. He cannot have been a Christian. Jesus is telling this story about someone he's heard of who acted, as far as we know, from no other prompting with elementary human solidarity. What other prompting do we need? Our species would not have survived. We wouldn't be met here if we didn't have, as well as many selfish instincts, the need, uh, and often for our own sake, to be of use to others, to combine with them, to take an interest in them, to, to care for them, and to, and to worry when they're in pain. No supernatural authority, as with the civil rights movement, is required for this. Morality comes from us, religion claims to have invented it on our behalf. Uh, then, okay, another example from the Older Testament. Is it really to be believed that until they got to the foot of Mount Sinai, the followers of Moses believed that up to then, adultery, murder, theft, and perjury were okay? They're suddenly told, oh, hey, we've got some new ideas for you. I don't think so. It's a bit of an insult to the ancient Jewish faith of which uh, Jacob and I are both rather disgraceful ornaments in our different ways. <laughs> <coughs> I think our ancestors were smarter than that, and even if they weren't smarter, they wouldn't have got that far if they'd been under the contrary impression. The golden rule is something you don't have to teach a child. There's no need to say, and if you don't follow this rule, 
you'll burn in hell forever. That's immoral teaching. Now, I hope I've made myself clear on the, but I'm wondering if I have, because you face me, Reverend, with two very unwelcome thoughts. Either I have been completely inarticulate in everything I've said this evening, or you have misunderstood me. I have, to throw my, I have to throw myself, or these are not mutually exclusive, and I should have seen that coming. Um, the argument for theism, that there, not only can we establish this prime mover's existence, but we can show by some form of induction that he intervenes in wars, that he answers prayers, that he cares who we sleep with and in what position, uh, that uh, what food we eat and on what days, is a ridiculous proposition. It's a claim to a truth that no primate can claim to make. Primates who claim to know it should be distrusted. Great damage has been done and continues to be done by such people and by, and by such ideas. You're better off thinking for yourself and taking all the risks and, I might add, all the pleasures that will come from that. The most overrated of the virtues is faith. The metaphysical claims of religion are untrue. Thank you. Religion is our first, that's why I'm so fascinated with it, it's our first version of the truth. It's our first attempt as a species. It's what we tried when we didn't know anything. We didn't know we lived on a spherical planet. We didn't know that our planet revolved around the sun. Uh, we didn't know that there were microorganisms that explained disease. We thought diseases came from curses or witches or uh, ill-wishing or uh, uh, devils or dust devils. We didn't know anything from the childish, terrified, ignorant uh, origins of our animal primate species we come to religion. It's also our first attempt at philosophy, our first attempt at morality, our first attempt at healthcare actually, but because it was our first, it is our worst. We now have better explanations for all these dreads and we have cleared up all of these mysteries, yet we still dwell um, and in some countries, in some societies, not just dwell but live under, under a totalitarian regime that forbids us to think about the progress that has been made or denies us the knowledge that these adva advances have in fact occurred. So it has become, uh, where once it probably was an aid to our survival, um, a, a really great peril to our continued ability to live as a civilized species. Um, indeed, I believe people, when they say that they have experienced miracles, I, bl I believe that they think that they have. I, I think I'm obliged to credit them if uh, it comes to that, um, as long as they keep it to, if you like, uh, if I can put it like this, modestly as I dare, to themselves. Um, if I believe that I was saved because once a baby boy was born and before mutilated, um, uh, uh, had a, uh, made the extraordinary discovery that he'd escaped the female birth canal. Mother was a virgin, or at least her birth canal was only one way. Uh, that thus I was... A, a sorry thing, by the way, religion's distaste for these regions, don't you find? <laughs> and something to put you on your guard. Suppose I thought, okay, now I know that, that must prove his teachings are true, which it doesn't seem to me that they do, but suppose I did and I'm going to be saved by it, I think that was a wonderful secret. It would make me happy. It should make me happy. It doesn't make people happy. They can't be happy till I believe it too. My children must be taught this stuff. No sir, no ma'am, no day, no way, no shape, no form. You keep your illusion private. Um, and I hope it does make you happy, and there's perhaps some reason why it would. But they we're told, no, we're told we, with the Pope's authority to sell, say you can't have a condom comes from his ability to certify a miracle, a disturbance in the natural order. I think it was David Hume who put it slightly vulgarly. This was again about the virgin birth, I think, which is more likely that the whole natural order is suspended or that a Jewish minx should tell a lie. <laughs> My question is, is to, to Christopher is how you can justify wanting to take something away from people from 95, that gives meaning to 95% of the American people and replace it with something that gives meaning to just 5% of the American people. Ha! Well, 
Um, what an incredibly stupid question. Um, <laughs> uh, first, first, I've said repeatedly that it, this stuff cannot be taken away from people. It is their favorite toy and it will remain so, <laughs> as, lo as Freud said, in the future of an illusion, it will remain that way as long as we're afraid of death and have no problem, which is, I think, likely to be quite a long time. Second, I hope I've made it clear <clears throat> that I'm perfectly happy for people to, to have these toys and to play with them at home and hug them to themselves and so on and share them with other people who come around and play with the toys. So that's absolutely fine. They are not to make me play with these toys. Okay? I will not play with the toys. Don't bring the toys to my house. Don't say, my children must play with these toys. Don't say, my toys might be a condom. Here we go again. Are not allowed by their toys. I'm not going to have any of that. Enough with clerical and religious bullying and intimidation. Is that finally clear? Have I got that across? Thank you. Next. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Sharp. Because I write for a very small atheist magazine called Free Inquiry and I'm published out of Amherst, Massachusetts, which did publish the cartoons. See, it's a responsibility. First, solidarity with the Danes. Second, people should see what the fuss is about. Hmm. Borders, books, takes our magazine off the rack. So we, you can't sell your magazine now. I've refused to read or speak in a Borders bookstore ever since. <laughs> the least I could do. Unless they really, really, really offer me a lot of money. And... <laughs> a complete capitulation, a total capitulation. And people say, why do I focus on the extremists? Because the extremists have the initiative, and His Holiness the Pope condemned what? The cartoons. Mm. The State Department condemned the cartoons. Not the violence. Not the campaign of intimidation. His, the Archbishop of Canterbury condemned the cartoons. Every church I know of condemned the blasphemy of the cartoons. Not the campaign of murder and sabotage. And intimidation. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, the barbarians are not at the gate. They're not at the gate. They're well inside. And who held open the door for them? The other religious did. Now get used to this because you may be living in the last few years where you can complain about it. Because the religious really mean this, you know. They are not just joking. They really mean to abolish everything you care about and they want to take away everything you love and to destroy everything you have and to replace it with a Stone Age ideology derived from the desert of Palestine in a very bad time in human history. Now, and just because they were there first, they think they own everything, they think they have the right to tell you what you can think, who you can sleep with, what you can eat, what you can 